Hello, everyone, and hello to Ken Yoshida. Thank you very much for being here today. Ken Yoshida is Professor of Applied Microbiology at the Department of Science, Technology, and Innovation at Kobe University in Japan. And since 2019, he's also a FEMS ambassador for Japan. I'm very happy to have Ken here with us. Thank you for joining us. And I would just uh, like to start with a sh short icebreaker and ask uh, what got you excited as a kid about microbiology? Uh, yeah, so um, I don't point the exact time, but uh, I was mesmerized by microscope. Uh, actually, this is one of the most important part of my life because uh, it seems like a clear water, but under the microscope, I can see a lot of things are moving in there. So I was so shocked. Even this clear water contains such a small atom, organisms. So then I decide to you know, work someday to research all those uh, invisible organisms. Amazing, amazing. I, I see a resemblance with uh, Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, who was the first to see that <laughs> organism. And for us, uh, it being at uh, in Delft, uh, we, th we think, uh, we, we know about this and we think about this. Uh, yeah, indeed, indeed. Very, so Tell us a little bit about your current area of research. How do you think it can help solve uh, current uh, societal problems or issues? All right, it's a good question. As, a, uh, as introduced, I am working uh, as a, a professor of applied microbiology. So it means uh, uh, nowadays we use microbes as a kind of cell factory to produce a lot of chemicals covering a wide range of uh, like from fuels to materials, okay? So now actually this action in science can change the world from petroleum or oil-based society into biomass-based society. So microbes is a very important element to make this a shift of society. Uh, to do that, we have to or change the metabolism or whatever the genetic information in the microbes. So that's why we have to develop new technology in genetic manipulation. So these things is our, our one of the focus in the laboratory. And uh, sooner or later, it can be you know, implemented to the, the reality society to produce chemicals using uh, biotechnology, especially microbes. Okay. Well, we are talking now online instead of in person because uh, obviously there is a, uh, the current COVID-19 crisis and we just change our life quite massively recently. And I just wanted to ask you, what do you think that this current COVID-19 pandemic thought us about how the scientific community can respond to a crisis? Uh, yeah, this is a very uh, touching uh, question. Actually, now ordinary people understand importance of microbiology. But to be honest, virus is not, is not a microorganisms, but this is related to all those uh, uh, invisible uh, things to have uh, the capacity to infect our, in our body. And uh, we scientists try to, you know, or let them understand what is the main problem with viruses and those things. And, uh, and also we proposed uh, the, how we can, uh, you know, fight against all those uh, uh, toxic things. And some people do understand the meaning and also the importance. However, the other part, of society just afraid of uh, being infected and they got to be panic. And I think uh, we need to develop more good education to let them understand and they accept how they have to behave. And all those things as uh, one of the turning point of our society to realize the importance of microbiology. This is a big impact on our scientific society, especially people working in microorganisms, microorganisms and microbiology. And also, on the other hand, uh, uh, we scientists propose the many uh, new uh, approach to solve this uh, pandemic problem. And even me, I propose uh, the possible uh, development of treatment, but the people all the time uh, have a kind of allergy about this kind of uh, far advanced technology, and uh, especially uh, GMO things is uh, really social allergic. So um, unfortunately, uh, all those uh, clever ideas cannot be implemented. And again, all those uh, education can help us to 
make the things much is rapidly and speedy to be implemented. So you, you, you seem to suggest kind of a double approach in a way. So first of all, research needs to continue, basic research for people to understand, for scientists to understand, like in this case, the etiology of the virus and develop new cures, but also as importantly, like proper communication so that everyone understands the risk and don't panic, for example, and they can be able to understand and, and, and react accordingly. Yes, exactly. So I think people do not know the meaning of words even. So vaccination and also or those things, people uh, don't understand what is the difference of all those uh, things. And I think uh, education is required in the both side as for the developed things and also the basic things. And we need to have a kind of matching point to have uh, the social and also uh, ordinarily uh, understanding in the society. So that's very important. Without this uh, kind of social panic about this, people do not realize the importance of those things. Because you mentioned also education, um, one, um, one question I wanted to ask you is about early career scientists. Uh, you have been awarded the prize for encouragement of young, young scientists in 2002 by the Japan so Society for Bioscience, Bioscience, Biotechnology and Agrochemistry. Um, I would be interested, what it is your approach to support early career scientists? This is a very delicate question. Uh, well, especially probably in Japan, uh, younger generation is a kind of timid and they sometimes try to be hidden and they are afraid of uh, being exposed sometimes. But on the other hand, the other group is all the time try to be all the time uh, animated and also uh, try to show up for themselves. And this kind of two groups is all the time uh, uh, in a kind of fight or like a tug of war. And as for a PI, we can see this kind of two different uh, personalities. Even uh, one person has these two personalities. And we try to uh, extract the good uh, uh, aspect of all these two different personalities um, in the groups or in one person and try to make the balancing of, uh, so if they need it, they can show up. However, if they don't like, they just, uh, be hidden. So uh, this kind of balance is very difficult. And that is why uh, I think the younger generation requires good mentoring and also um, like a guidance. So sometimes we have a kind of a systemic, systematic uh, uh, organization to help them to, you know, make this balancing. Like uh, without showing uh, their ability, people do not know what they he, he or she can do. But if they experience they're pretty much afraid to do that. Uh, we have to encourage them. So like this way, and not only the realistic uh, um, well, scientific uh, ability, but also this kind of uh, personality is also trained and also, um, let's say, uh, uh, encouraged. Yeah. So in this way, I'm all the time uh, keeping attention about these, these points as well. Yeah. So it seems like a personalized approach in a way in which uh, you try to to uh, to encourage the best of your students and and try to elevate uh, the best the best uh, qualities they they already have or maybe they just they need encouragement to to bring forward. Yes, to be honest, as for the uh, scientific quality of their works, can be accomplished by themselves. You know, this is a really elementary. You know, it's a, they have to do that. But even they have a good things, a good seeds, sometimes they do not know how to show it up. So then in this case, we can be a good mentor to tell them how they can uh, make it uh, more, you know, uh, obvious or easily to be recognized. So in this case, like as for the realistic uh, scientific uh, approach, it's the requirement to be a good scientist. But people are sometimes timid or they do not know how to show them up. So in this case, our, you know, help is uh, quite an effective. So far I have been uh, experiencing uh, in this kind of things. And do you think there is, um, these approaches that you're outlining are different in, in, in Japan versus the rest of the world or is a, 
is a common trait of scientists that they need not just to be good scientists, but also be able to present effectively or to convey the message effectively. Yeah, to be honest, I think uh, uh, probably gen in general uh, aspect, things are not that different. However, I can see the difference in the basic education in Japan and Europe is quite different, you know. So in Japan, we all the time saying uh, if somebody is outstanding, then the other try to kick him out. Okay. But in Europe, like somebody is uh, very good, people try to encourage them. Okay, so this kind of uh, social attitude is a bit different. In this case, I think uh, we try to use or we try to import the way of European people do, as for all those talented people. Yeah, in general, I have a kind of uh, impression in Japan try to equalize everything, too much to equalize. So if somebody is too good, they say that they try to, uh, you know, kick him out or try to reduce his ability. So. This is quite different, uh, but nowadays we're changing a bit, and but yet this is traditionally uh, hidden in Japanese uh, culture, I think. So in the, I can point this uh, difference. That's very interesting, very interesting. And thinking more, a little bit more globally now, and not just uh, the situation in Japan versus the rest of the world. What do you think are challenges today to support the recovery scientist? And are these challenges different in comparison to the past? And what might be further challenges in the future to support early career scientists or for early career scientists to be established and have, have a career in science? Probably every year on the earth, uh, like a post, new post for younger generation is uh, quite limited. And like even the postdocs used to be, we can enjoy a, a lot of postdocs in the laboratory. But because of the budget limitation, we have to reduce the number of postdoc. And so then automatically to get a position is very competitive. And some of the very talented students, they just quit on the way of research and they try to find a job in the companies because the wage is better and also they can enjoy more promising perspective in companies. So now, Probably not only Japan, but also in Europe. Also, it's very difficult to find a good position or promising positions for younger generation. That's a very, very big issue. And I think we need to think about generating the new positions for younger generation. And or otherwise, we lose our successors in the scientific activity. So I think this is the most important issue at this moment every year. So it seems to me that you're saying that also collaborations probably need to be also very, very much important in the future. Indeed. Actually, it's been uh, pretty much recommended to have an international collaboration. Like uh, now I'm applying one of the uh, Horizon 2020 program, which is naming a Japanese uh, colleague has to be involved in. Okay, In this way, even the EU or government is trying to stimulate the collaboration between EU and Japan. But it's not only Japan, but also Korea or Singapore or anywhere. It's a European side try to you know, stimulate European colleagues to find a third party or third countries, in, including Japan. And this is a good way of thinking, like to have a better chance of collaboration. That's very interesting. Then I will jump to to a uh, to a question, which was a bit far far ahead in the list, uh, but it seems like a very nice segue. Which is, uh, since you are FEMS ambassador for Japan, what do you think is the best way to build bridges and collaboration between Japan, science, and the rest of the world? There could be two ways to make this uh, uh, encouragement of this kind of uh, bridging of the different uh, countries and regions. One is. So uh, we have to exchange younger generation in a certain time of certain uh, time, like at least one year or a couple of years to exchange all those younger generation because uh, you through the uh, exchanging, uh, we can have a better understanding of the difference and the similarity. And also uh, in a scientific way, we can exchange the materials and also the uh, technologies. Uh, this is very, very effective to have a tight bridge. Actually, me, myself, I was just staying in France, and at the moment I established a lot of communication and also friendships and also exchange technical uh, things, and this is 
yet now I'm enjoying this situation. So this kind of uh, uh, human resource exchange is one of the things. And the other things, as I told you, are like the governmental or uh, international encouragement in a collaboration. This kind of things cannot be done only by the conferences and also just uh, uh, having a uh, chat. You know, so this is more or uh, sustainable and also a uh, substantial exchange can be done only by these two ways of uh, support human resource exchange and also governmental support for the uh, collaborative uh, research thank you another question which is related is about the fact that scientists are really truly globetrotters they travel often to conferences whenever possible of course now it is not not the case but they also relocate often during their career to different country, like you did to for a postdoc in France. How important do you think it is for science to be international rather than be done in, in separately in, dif in, in different country? I can't catch your question. Um, uh, you mean like a, to make a travel and or this online is to compare the two things or? Uh, no, I meant because we were talking about, about the fact that scientists needs to to travel and uh, and, and it is important to establish um, collaboration with scientists, with colleagues, and this also needs to be supported by, by agencies so that this is possible. Um, so my question was, um, how important do you think it is for science to be international? You mean uh, uh, we can do a good science only depending upon international collaboration or not? So these are things? On Japanese side, actually government try to stimulate us to have a better international collaboration because they made uh, some calculation uh, like a, or the um, evaluation of the papers and they found it out uh, international collaboration and the good citation is correlating to each other. So that's why Japanese government is now trying to convince us to have better international collaborations or more international collaborations, okay? This is just uh, uh, the calculation or all the statics However, from my point of view, international collaboration can help students to improve their thinking way more globally. And actually sometimes, for example, in one region, one uh, bacteria or one technology was pretty much too regarded and people never ever discard this. However, using the chance of international collaboration, uh, we found it out, so far we believed uh, this one is the best, but we can have another choice in the other place, okay? In this way, we can uh, switch the uh, kind of the too much established knowledge or too much established knowledge and notion can be changed because of this new idea coming from collaboration, okay? In this way, uh, we can uh, improve our uh, too much prejudice, uh, all those things, and uh, international collaboration can make a breakthrough of all those uh, previous knowledge or uh, like a sort of belief can be completely changed by this. And uh, in this way, not only the you know, evaluation of papers and those things, but also this kind of uh, big change of the thinking way is all the time we can enjoy from the international collaboration. So, um, I uh, try to convince my students in uh, the latter way of thinking way to enjoy international collaboration. So it seems to me you're saying that uh, there is still differences in, in, from country to country. Now science is done for, for whatever reason. And that uh, international collaboration and traveling and, and, and exchanges help to, to equalize science and to advance it because then you can... You can jointly find the better the better maybe technique or the best solution or the best results so for me also maybe a personal question because i've never been to japan would be what are in your opinion the difference on how science is done in japan versus the rest of the world do you see any <laughs> or or maybe it's too much a broad question um i think i would not the best person to answer this question because i am pretty much already europeanized i think so <laughs> and however yeah of course the society is quite different like a hierarchy of uh, structure of uh, all every single institute is uh, quite different from european way 
and uh, students are very polite to PIs and also all those position holders. And every single uh, student in Japan has to pay tuition. <laughs> And in Europe and in many countries, people can learn free. Even if they are working in the laboratory, they can be paid. But in Japan, every single student has to pay to, for, to learn by themselves. So this is a big a difference. Even as a PhD student, even during, during research. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so PhD students have to pay tuition. This is a basic. However, they can have scholarship. So it can be come and go. So then it can be qualified. However, they do not have any benefit. So this is a big difference. This is an economical or social reason. Actually, in Japan, uh, students are taught to pay for their learning. So this is traditional way. And only tip of iceberg, very, very talented students can enjoy uh, free uh, learning, you know. So this qualification is very tough and only a limited number of students can enjoy this. And this is very different. And... Uh, um, not only for that, like uh, uh, even a uh, career uh, uh, position holders, researchers, is also uh, quite different from the European uh, way. And uh, people cannot change the position so easily. In Europe, quite uh, frequently, people can switch from one place to another, right? But in Japan, if you uh, change the position from one uh, institute to another, it means a uh, kind of big change in the life. So this is, uh, in the reality, the big difference. Yeah. Oh, okay. For me, this is very interesting because at least the way I know it from a limited perspective is that in Europe, um, it's very much encouraged to change uh, institute. For example, yeah. when you switch it's... from master to PhD or from PhD to postdoc. Yeah, but yet uh, we are still changing. And uh, some university try to convince uh, all those uh, researchers has to move out and uh, once at least then if they can be trained enough they can have uh, the possibility to apply back into the, his or her original institute also this they have some university has this system but most of the universities or most of the institute has a tendency to keep uh, the uh, original uh, member to have a kind of escalator system to stay on uh, there uh, so we are still in a mixture of these situations. So it can be also common that uh, a scientist in Japan will do a PhD, postdoc, and then get tenure at the same institute? Yes. And um, actually, uh, it's been recommended to be an uh, assistant professor, for example. So we use the tenure system nowadays. So like five years time, they can be evaluated. And once they are successful, they can stay like a tenure forever. But this is quite recent. Used to be, we do not have this. So like once you are assigned as assistant professor, so you can have a permanent position there. So but people now change it, so especially younger generation. So younger generation is now uh, suffering from very hard time to have the, the stable, stabilized situation in, uh, in the research. And this is... Uh, yeah, they say like they stimulate a competition to have a better uh, ability, a better science. Uh, well, but this is uh, just provoking uh, higher, more and more competitions. But sooner or later, only a qualified scientist can survive in the end. And one way to for scientists and for early career scientists to to showcase their work and to, to get feedbacks, quality feedbacks from other researchers is going to conferences. And uh, of course now is 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 a bit different because we are having an online conference, but it's still very important to to collaborate and to get feedbacks also during this time, of course. And for many early career scientists, this uh, FEMS con conference will be the first um, their first conference. What advice will you have for young scientists uh, starting their scientific career, in particular with regard to going to uh, to conferences? I think uh, uh, this online conference is a good opportunity for younger generation to acquire the a lot of keywords and also people who specialize in a specific field. And then by uh, watching their presentation, I think they can uh, work with their own computer to find out another research by themselves. 
And uh, so I think they can minimize the time to catch up the latest or uh, newest uh, things. And not only listening to our presentation in the hall, but also they can use their computer freely. And uh, this is uh, one of the advantage for them to enjoy this online conference. And another thing is, uh, well, nowadays we have to take care of all those uh, uh, for example, a handicapped people. Handicapped people is not easy to travel long distance. But by using this opportunity, all those who are uh, handicapped uh, can enjoy these uh, things in life. And I think uh, even uh, solving this problem of pandemic, uh, I think we should continue this online because this can be really a border free for people or who is working in science and not only physical and they can uh, enjoy uh, all the latest news and uh, information. So I think in this way, uh, online conference can be usable uh, later on, I think. So this is definitely a, a positive side of online conference that they can be more, more inclusive also for scientists that uh, cannot travel extensively or maybe also because of cost or also because of time constraint. And I think it's a very good way to finish uh, the interview with this note because we are we are now in an online conference. And I wanted to okay. thank you very much for your feedback and for agreeing to be at, the, at this interview. I just wanted to remind that the talk is going to be in one hour and a half uh, at 4 p.m at the session two and the talk is about application of the gram positive conjugative plasmid PLS20 for rapid, rapid and easy transformation of intra and interspecies. Thank you so much for being here and I wish you a very pleasant and successful online conference. Thank you very much. I hope that people can enjoy my presentation then. Thank you, Ken. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.